Medical professionals, when did you have to tell a patient, I've seen it all before, to comfort them, but really, you have never seen something so bad or of that nature? Happened to me, not a medical professional. A friend of mine bought a house and I moved in with him to help fix it up, polish it, and then maybe sell it. So we are in the backyard pulling weeds and cutting down vines and I see this 4-inch diameter vine with fuzzy roots attached to the brick climbing all the way up the wall. I'm not a particularly country boy, more urban, but my friend had warned me of poison ivy in the back of the house. I called him over and he said, oh, don't worry, it doesn't grow that big. He was wrong. Less than a week later, I'm covered up and down, both arms, bad enough. I look like a third degree burn victim. It has gotten into my bloodstream and appeared on my legs, back, chest, and even my feet, which all had been covered, of course. I remember my GP looked at me with my shirt off and said in the most nonchalant voice, oh, that's not quite the worst I've ever seen, with serious emphasis on the one word. It took me two weeks of steroids to even return to work and another two weeks to lose the last of them. I spent that time researching poison ivy, and I have to brag, I'm an expert on how to track down and end that frickin' plant. I hate poison ivy. Go to your local hardware store and they will sell a container of poison ivy killer. The stuff is good, but if you use it as directed, I can guarantee the stuff will return time and again to haunt you. The vine originates underground, not very deeply though. Dig around while covered in protective clothing, etc. and find the main trunk of the vine. Drill holes through the vine about half the diameter of the stalk and space them about 3-5 to feet, 1-2 to meters apart. Pour the poison ivy killer directly into the hole. Do not dilute it. Just pour it right in. Soak the vine well, maybe 50 to 100 milliliters or a fourth or a half cup, depending on the size of the vine. This should do the trick. Of course, it will need to be dug up and out, but it ought to be pretty dead within a week. If that doesn't do it, repeat the process a second time. Also, do this when there is no rain forecasted. Good luck and kill it dead. Also, it seems that everyone either has a story about getting it all over and hating it, I'm so sorry for you, or telling how they are immune to it. Fun fact about that, allergies change. You can be immune all your life and then one morning wake up allergic to just about anything. Funny story to illustrate this, I told someone about my poison ivy situation once and she told me about her little brother who was apparently not allergic. He would play pranks by grabbing it and rubbing it all over himself to try to convince other people that it wasn't poison ivy. He pulled a prank one day and had a wedding to attend two days later. He suddenly developed an allergy under the suit. Moral of the story, kill the plant when you find it, evil little... Last tip I just remembered, if you go out in the woods and suspect you are going to encounter poison ivy, etc. at all, bring a can of spray deodorant with you. The aluminum chloride, I think that's the chemical, in it will neutralize the oil and prevent allergic attack. Otherwise, scrub with soap and water within 10-15 minutes after exposure. Alright, I'm already itching just reading this. Story 2. Oh, me, I have a story. I have been an RN for 12 years now and seen a lot of stuff. I was particularly lucky in nursing school and got to watch open heart surgery, joint replacement, kidney removal, all kinds of neat stuff right over the surgeon's shoulder. The only one that ever gave me a problem was this kid about 10 years old getting his tonsils removed. So I'm standing there, I look up, and all of a sudden everything's getting sparkly. I just said, I need to leave right now. Surgeon takes his tools out of the kid's mouth and says, okay, someone please walk him out, thanks. So I learned that for some reason I get queasy when it's kids being hurt, which is funny because I was a pediatrics nurse for quite a while after school. Anyway, the actual story, I wasn't even at work, but maybe two years ago, I was living with my girlfriend at the time and her three young boys. That day, the youngest, about seven, had been climbing up a big lilac bush in the yard that I'd trimmed the day before. He slipped and fell out. A sharp cut branch caught him in the face on his way down. I was in the kitchen and heard this blood-curdling scream and ran outside. I brought him in, sat him on the kitchen table, and took a look. It seemed like he was pretty lucky. There was just a deep cut on the bottom of his nose. Well, he was bleeding pretty decently, so his mother and I took him to the emergency room. When we got there, there's only a physician's assistant on duty. He takes a look and thinks maybe it could use a couple of stitches. Or, he says, he could call on the on-call ENT surgeon for another opinion. We told him that, all due respect, we would like to have a surgeon take a look, just in case. 
Good thing we did. The stick cut up under the nose. We just hadn't moved it much. And as soon as the surgeon came in while he's laying on the exam table screaming, suddenly I got really hot. Things started getting hazy. I realized I'm about to pass out. So I quickly exited the room and sat down at the exact same time as my girlfriend, who was also a nurse. Neither of us could take it. Story 3 Not my story, but my SO was in training as a nurse's aide. On her first internship, she was assigned to the ER at a trauma center. The first person on her first shift of her first internship of three was an older homeless man complaining of his foot hurting. After the medical staff took a quick look at the foot, they didn't initially see anything wrong, so they tried to remove his pants to examine the leg. The pants didn't move, they were fused to his skin. They had to surgically remove his jeans, and the moment the scalpel made the first incision, she described it as, as if Slimer from Ghostbusters barfed out of his leg, and the nurse ran out of the room gagging. After getting over the initial shock, apparently that's the moment when she knew she was meant for the job. Even the surgeon was having a pretty hard time keeping his composure, but she was fine. More fascinated than anything and apparently not affected by bad smells as most people are. They had to tell him his leg was going to be okay. He was severely mentally ill and might have freaked the hell out, despite knowing he could pass from the infection. Apparently he survived and they managed to save the leg, which is beyond incredible. Story 4 As a new nurse, I worked on a nephrology unit, which meant that we dealt with mostly patients who had kidney failure and needed hemodialysis three times a week to clean their blood. A patient was admitted through the emergency room and told me that he hadn't been to dialysis in four weeks. He had kidney failure, had lost custody of his kids after a messy divorce, and had no will to live. He planned to just stay in his home until he passed. He probably wasn't far from it, but a neighbor who hadn't seen him for a few weeks peeked in the window and saw him sitting, unresponsive, on the couch. They called 911 and he was brought to my hospital. Three weeks is an insanely long time to go without dialysis. Dialysis removes toxins and excess fluid from your blood. Missing a session can leave you feeling sick and swollen. Missing 12 sessions can end you. This guy was so swollen. He looked like that girl from Willy Wonka that turned into a blueberry. His feet and ankles were particularly massive. I wasn't sure that he'd live. Miraculously, after several dialysis sessions, he'd fully deflated. However, he was left with lots of loose skin afterwards, which had the fragile texture of an old balloon. One night, he called me to his room and said, I think my foot is bleeding. He was right. He'd slid down towards the bottom of his bed and used his legs to push himself back up towards the top. Keep in mind, he has fragile skin now. I had no idea what to do, so I just called Code Blue. The patient wasn't dead or dying, but no part of nursing school or practice had prepared me for this. I just needed to get a whole bunch of people to the room as quickly as possible. I threw on a waterproof gown and some gloves and held pressure on the bottoms of his feet with a towel until help arrived. They didn't know what to do either. We called in the general surgeon who seemed to think we might be exaggerating the extent of the damage and blood loss. He told us he'd be in there in an hour and just to hold pressure until it stopped bleeding. We soaked towel after towel until finally the surgeon showed up. He breezes into the room, moves my towel away and says, hmm. Then he reaches towards the patient's foot and pulls off a huge softball-sized blood clot. In that moment, time stopped. He held out his hand, holding it, and I, without really thinking about what I was doing, held my hand out too. In the next moment, several things happened all at once. I realized what I was holding. I started dry heaving. I dropped it on the floor. The surgeon exclaims, oh Jesus, not in response to my gags, but because the patient's foot is now profusely bleeding again. He darts off and tells us to get the patient down to the OR immediately. We get him down there and on the way back realize that he'd left a trail down the hallways into the elevator and to the operating theater. I saw the patient during my next shift and he joked, I thought you were going to pass out when the doctor handed you that mess. I don't know about you guys, but I'm starting to feel a little lightheaded after this story. Um, To keep your mind a bit off of this, please do help me out and remember to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel while I recover. I'll get to the next story in just a few moments. Story 5 A good while back, I had incredible pain in my lower stomach. I had it once before a few months earlier and it passed within a day, so I decided to wait it out again. 
Well, it didn't pass, and my parents eventually got me to a doctor who did some ultrasound, and he sent me off to the ER because my appendix needed to leave my body immediately. I had waited way too long already. To cut a long story slightly shorter, my parents drove me to the ER. I waited in the waiting room for a while, despite explaining quite clearly what was wrong with me. They finally checked up on me, did another ultrasound thingy, determined my appendix either was about to burst or had already burst, and prepped me for immediate surgery. Minutes before said surgery, a nurse asks me if I want more painkillers, but I figure I've taken it for hours, I can take a few more minutes. Life pro tip, kids, if a nurse offers you painkillers, you take them. They suddenly got multiple incredibly urgent cases and my surgery was delayed. So people dressed for outside work burst in and carry me and my medical trolley off into an ambulance and they ship me to the next town to get surgery elsewhere since I was just urgent enough to really, really need surgery, but not more urgent than whatever just came up. Remember when I didn't take the offered painkillers? An ambulance ride is actually incredibly bumpy when you've got a very painful body part. Between cries and whimpers of pain, I managed to relay the situation to the guy riding in the back with me, who was very sympathetic to my suffering, but couldn't exactly administer meds to me on a bumpy, hurried ride to the next town over. Anyway, to cut a long story a little short once more, I went under the knife, spent a while in intensive care, was moved pretty much next door to the head doctor's office to recover, but wouldn't get better. These few days are a blur of meds and pain and ugh, so I don't remember them very clearly. The first thing I remember with great clarity is the bit I am writing about. My parents were in the room with me and a nurse was checking in on me. I didn't exactly have a mirror, but my dad mentioned I was incredibly, incredibly pale. In his words that I never question to this day, he said he had seen a few corpses in his time and I was looking pretty close to being one. My mother asked the nurse if I was going to make it. The nurse looked at me, looked at the clipboard, and excused herself, hurrying out of the room without giving an answer. This was incredibly worrying for everyone involved, even more worrying than a no. To cut the story short for a third time, I went into surgery a second time, got a massive scar across my stomach out of the whole thing, and survived after two whole weeks in that hospital. And not a single second of that whole thing was fun. Moral of the story, if you have incredibly intense pain in your lower stomach, pretty sure mine was off to the left a bit, go to a freaking doctor immediately. If caught early, that's a little cut into your belly button that heals invisibly and you're out in a day or two. Wait and you're going to pass away or almost pass away and get massive ugly scars out of it. Also, nurses, please, for the love of God, don't just excuse yourself when a patient or their parents ask you if they're going to make it. That is the single most worrying thing you could do. Just tell them you've seen it all before to comfort them. Story 6. I had to drop my first nasogastric tube on a rather hysterical older teen. I was actually a very experienced nurse, but just had never had the opportunity to insert one. I check the procedure manual, watch a YouTube video, and walk in the room. I'm not worried, this usually isn't that difficult, and I'm in general a skilled nurse. Girl is sobbing, mom has to leave the room, she's so upset, and the angry dad tells me he's a paramedic and that I better know my stuff. Dad says aggressively, have you done this before? I say, I can't even count the number of times I've done this. Girl says, will this damage my vocal cords? Curious question, but I laugh a little and say with a smile, not if you stay calm and follow my instructions. Dad says, because she has studied under a name I didn't recognize for years and has a full ride to fancy art school that I did recognize. That NG tube slid in like butter, no problem. Girl did just fine. I'm not gonna lie, I was sweating just a bit. Also, one time, some young 30-ish guy, he was lying passed out on the floor of the bathroom while our rapid response team assembled, trying to figure out how to get this massive young man out of a rather small space. He saw all of it and just calmly looked at me and said, that's a lot of blood, am I dying? I said, nah, I used to work labor and delivery. I know it looks like a lot, but I've seen way worse. You're going to be just fine. That was a lie, even in L&D, and I wasn't sure he was going to make it. He lived. Story 7. Nursing student here. I'm currently doing my preceptorship, but maybe six months ago during my pediatric rotation, my nurse and I were caring for a six-year-old post-tonsillectomy. These are extremely common procedures, so neither of us thought too much when the child was saying it hurt and he wanted ice cream. 
It was an hour post-op, so we were still waiting for a gag reflex and bowel sounds, but we still assessed him thoroughly and found nothing abnormal besides maybe a little more red around the sutures than normal. Another 15 minutes later, he is crying from pain and starting to cough and says dry throat, so we used wet sponges to correct some dryness. All of a sudden, the coughing gets very deep and strong, and then a final cough sends a suture flying out of his mouth and an absurd amount of red. The parents started freaking the heck out, shaking him and screaming at us to fix him. The nurse and I are trying to calm these two down. I've seen births go poorly, but the amount of red from this small child was mind-boggling. I had it all over me as I was suctioning and applying oxygen. The child eventually went into shock and was rushed to the OR. This is uncommon, but not the worst we have seen by any means. Story 8 A few years back, I was in the ER. An ambulance came and they dropped a very old lady, very skinny. She was dehydrated, had 40 degrees Celsius fever, and was covered by several blankets. The ambulance that brought her had no medical personnel. They were volunteers with no training, so I start to check her out. Call the nurse to get a line, then the sister of the patient gets there, another very old lady. So while she tells me the story of how her sister got sick, I start to remove the blankets so I can do a full check. Oh boy, was I not ready. The smells started to hit me, but I had to remove all the fabric. After I pulled the last one, a ton of critters dropped on the floor, the bed, my shoes. So I look at her sister with my eyes wide open and ask how that happened. She tells me she's in bed covered since she lost her walk like two weeks before. She never changed her or cleaned her because it was painful to the patient. So I tell her she is in bad shape and that is going to need surgery and that she could pass. But I had seen people that were in worse shape make it out. She cries a bit and tells me she doesn't want to be alone. They had no relatives. I tell her we're going to do our best, start everything I can do for her, get the surgeon, the lady passed on the OR. I'd never seen anything like it, and I haven't ever since. I hope I never have to see that again. Story 9. Patient names and hospital locations have been edited for privacy, so leave the hippa hippos at home. To set the stage, it's a sweltering, muggy, 90-plus degree day in the beginning of summer. This will be important later, I promise. One of my first shifts as a senior ER resident was a good trauma day, a few intubations, I felt like a rock star. Gets to the end of my shift, about 45 minutes before relief gets in. I see personal complaint listed up on our whiteboard for a 45-year-old male. We will call him Mr. F. Now what this usually means is some sort of personal complaint versus infections all the way up to and including being violated. I figure I'll take it as my last patient for the day and jump on this grenade. I let the other senior know I may be a bit in this exam room if there is a kit included. She thanked me for dealing with it and off we went. I enter the room and there is a pleasant enough gentleman with his wife sitting and waiting patiently. I go through the normal introductions. Hi, how are you? I'm so glad you chose McHospital for your emergency care, etc. I then ask him what brings him to us today and I quote, he says, You'll never believe me but I read online that inserting steel into your Slim Jim will cure a urinary tract infection. My eyes must have gone wide because he then turned to his wife and said, I told you they'd think I'm a freak. I reassured him it was simply my job to take care of him and no judgment was cast. I then had the awesome job of trying to manually manipulate it to try and get it unlinked. Remember earlier when I described the weather? This is where it is important. By no means the worst thing I've smelled. Anyway, I can't fix his problem at all, so I bail and page the urology resident on call. She happens to be one of my good friends and is smoking hot. Apparently was a model before going to medical school hot. She calls me back and I try to explain to her what is going on. Hot urology resident just says, Wait, he did what? I tell her to just go down here and the situation will make more sense. So she ambles on down and takes a look. First response is, Huh, that's a new one. Then tries to manually manipulate it in a similar fashion to me. This is where it gets even funnier because essentially this middle-aged man has a hot blonde in her 20s. So he starts to get, you know, in front of his wife who didn't want to leave the room who then started yelling at him, which made it bigger. Eventually, the urology resident bailed because of this drama, ended up having to take him to the OR. I hope you enjoyed the video, especially with that crazy last story. 
And if you made it this far, I'm sure you're also going to enjoy Doctors. What made you say, how are you still alive? Story 2 was unbelievable and will make you thank your stars that you're still alive. I'll see you in that video and thank you for watching this one.